So there's no such thing as a wee story in Ireland. Well, it doesn't mean it's a short story anyway. Uh, I just I want to tell you about my dad. Um, and I just put on his ring. It's been on the altar for our family lineage this week. Mm. And uh, I'm going to try to... This is going to be a story, but I want you to experience what I experienced too. So... This is a story about loss and death, um, but it's also a story about beauty and stillness um, and letting go. So as the story goes, if you find yourself caught in your mind and comparing or attaching, I invite you to let go into the stillness and connect with the beauty. So uh, Shane, Kevin Mulhall of the Mwe Cahal and the Parl clans uh, died two months ago yesterday mm. and it was a beautiful death mm. so so beautiful um, when I was born our souls made a deal that I was going to help him die consciously I wasn't aware of that deal until about ten weeks ago um, but six months before he passed I was sitting at my laptop in my apartment in Brooklyn and I could feel his heartbeat inside my body. And I just knew it was him. And we knew he was very ill at this stage with cancer. Um, and I knew he was calling out for something, but I didn't know what it was. And uh, with two weeks before he passed, the doctors were saying, He's, you've got six to 12 months. And I knew in my body that that wasn't true. I could feel like a cat of nine tails, the cancer moving through my body in some way as it moved through his. And I said, Dad, I'm coming home. And he said, no, no, there's no need, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm coming home. So I came home with about a week and a half to go. It was also because he hadn't done his taxes or accounts for six years, so there was a little bit of an urgency to that. <laughs> this is my dad. And uh, my dad had been a meditator for 40 years and a big follower of um, Adwaita Vedanta. And... Um, he knew that he wanted to die consciously. His ideal death was to sit there and uh, to be meditating and then say, now. No. No. <laughs> uh, like all the good stories you hear from India. Uh, he didn't have quite the same setup, but there was something that he really wanted to do uh, mindfully and consciously. Um, and when I walked into the hospital room, uh, as best he could, he hugged me in a way that usually a child hugs a parent, hmm. in that way that I need you and their, their head nussles into your chest. And uh, when we got the room, I sat down to meditate, and very quickly his, his energetic body just lifted out of his and came and rested into mine. And the next week and a half, I felt like Whoopi Goldberg in the movie Ghost, <laughs> uh, which is an odd thing to feel. Uh, it was the most beautiful dance and my dad hated to dance. And uh, he had to dance for a week and a half. And um, there were many, many sort of very beautiful, magical moments, um, which are kind of a great part of the story, but they're also the distracting part of the story. Um, what was really profound for me was seeing that I had to let go, to let go of that us Mulhall's love to know. So when the doctors would walk by, we'd be like, what are we dealing with here? Give us exact figures. And nobody could. And it became so obvious that we just had to all let go. And in that letting go of control that we never had in the first place, um, I was able to just drop to a place I've been before, and I call it the center of the universe. And it's way down even below that pelvic bowl. And from that place, I was able to step into deep trust. And my mantra for the week and a half just became trust the divine, trust the divine. Um, in, the, in the craziest of moments, in the moments when um, you wouldn't necessarily wish you had to deal with those moments, when you have to lean over because the doctors are still saying, 
that it's weeks and weeks and you know it's not. And you lean over and you tell your dad that it's time to prepare yourself and to let go of everything and just focus on the divine. To know in those moments that you deeply trust what's happening. Um, and because of that incredible stillness and that deep trust, it was the most beautiful experience. All I could see was beauty. We, we sort of suffocated him with a bedside vigil for days. Um, he was very confused by that because even though he spent um, his whole life dedicated to the service of others, um, he found it hard to receive love and he was confused by that. Um, but we all stood there and uh, not everybody in the room was able to connect with the beauty. A lot of people felt that this was very unfair, a 65 year old man. Um, and it was just a beautiful thing. And to know that he was there and dancing between the two worlds and to be smiling, <laughs> like with sore cheeks smiling in a room with your dad who's got hours to live is a very profound experience. And then, um, because there was an incredible amount happening energetically between the two of us, um, he lost his, his, a lot of his speech. And because he was dancing between the two worlds so much, what he was talking about um, wasn't always relevant to this world. Um, he did say one very beautiful thing, two very beautiful things about the other world. I used to ask him about it. And he said, where did, where did all of them go? I said, where did, ever, where did who go? He said, all of the Indian women that were here. And I said, well, what were they doing? And he said, they've come a very far way to give me lunch and feed me. Mm. I said, okay. And then some of his last words were, uh, no man has ever written this story. No one living can see this story. Mm. And we've no idea what the story was, but we know he's enjoying it right now. Um, and then to, uh, I, w I wasn't present for his actual passing and because of what was happening energetically, he kept asking me to leave that evening and um, my system would not, I believe would not have been able to take the stopping of the heart. Um, and so we got the call at two in the morning and we, I came back in, my sister and my aunt were with him and uh, to still be connected with that center of the universe and the beauty and the sadness in all of it mm. and the beauty of the sadness mm. and the sadness rooted in the center. Mm. Um, and it was, there was just room for it all. Mm. And then skip a few days, we, we did some, you know, we got to meditate and uh, bathe him and uh, do all kinds of wonderful things that w in the West we have lost connection with around death and uh, um, then for the, the actual funeral it was a very very large amount of people in the church we, he was a very loved man who had a not a public profile but he played the role of teacher to a lot of people and um, when the doors opened you could feel the wave of sadness mm. come out the doors and I remember we were carrying the casket. And I just said, I had to give the eulogy as well. And I said, okay. And the wave came cr like rushing through my system. And I just went, trust this too. And within about 20 steps, that sadness was still in the room, but this stillness and that root had risen up to a new strength. Um, and the rest of the day unfolded with, with a smile on the face. Mm. And then the last thing I'll say is that uh, the next day I was looking through his accounts that we didn't get to finish. Um, I was looking through his accounts and looking for an envelope and I had this very profound and um, very profound thought, which was, shit, dad's dead. Mm. And I went, right to the core and I went trust that too and it was beautiful that's the new story